Social Ecology and Communalism, by Murray Bookchin, published by AK Press of Oakland, California, 2007. The Role of Social Ecology in a Period of Reaction Social ecology developed out of important social and theoretical problems that faced the left in the post-World War II period. The historical realities of the 1940s and the 1950s completely invalidated the perspectives of a proletarian revolution, of a chronic economic crisis that would bring capitalism to its knees, and of commitment to a centralistic workers' party that would seize state power and, by dictatorial means, initiate a transition to socialism and communism. It became painfully evident in time that no such generalized crisis was in the offing, indeed, that the proletariat and any party, or labor confederation, that spoke in the name of the working class could not be regarded as a hegemonic force in social transformation. Quite to the contrary, capitalism emerged from the war stronger and more stable than it had been at any time in its history. A generalized crisis could be managed to one degree or another within a strictly bourgeois framework, let alone the many limited and cyclical crises normal to capitalism. The proletariat, in turn, ceased to play the hegemonic role that the left had assigned to it for more than a century, and Leninist forms of organization were evidently vulnerable to bureaucratic degeneration. Moreover, capitalism, following the logic of its own nature as a competitive market economy, was creating social and cultural issues that had not been adequately encompassed by the traditional left of the interwar era, 1917-39. To be sure, the traditional left's theoretical cornerstone, notably, the class struggle between wage labor and capital, had not disappeared, nor had economic exploitation ceased to exist. But the issues that had defined the traditional left, more precisely, proletarian socialism in all its forms, had broadened immensely, expanding both the nature of oppression and the meaning of freedom. Hierarchy, while not supplanting the issue of class struggle began to move to the foreground of at least Euro-American radical concerns, in the widespread challenges raised by the 60s new left and youth culture to authority as such, not only to the state. Domination, while not supplanting exploitation, became the target of radical critique and practice, in the early civil rights movement in the United States, in attempts to remove conventional constraints on sexual behavior, dress, lifestyle, and values, and later, in the rise of feminist movements, ecological movements that challenged the myth of dominating the natural world, and movements for gay and lesbian liberation. It is unlikely that any of these movements would have emerged had capitalism at mid-century not created all the indispensable technological preconditions for a libertarian communist society, prospects that are consistent with Enlightenment ideals and the progressive dimensions of modernity. One must return to the great debates that began in the late 1950s over the prospects for free time and material abundance to understand the ideological atmosphere that new technologies such as automation created and the extent to which they were absorbed by the new left of the 1960s. The prospect of a post-scarcity society, free of material want and demanding toil, opened a new horizon of potentiality and hope, ironically, reiterating the prescient demands of the Berlin Dadaists of 1919 for universal unemployment, which stood in marked contrast to the traditional left's demand for full employment. The Struggle for a Rational Society Social ecology, as developed in the United States in the early 60s, long after the expression had fallen into disuse as a variant of human ecology, tried to advance a coherent, developmental, and socially practical outlook to deal with the changes in radicalism and capitalism that were in the offing. Indeed, in great part, it actually anticipated them. Long before an ecology movement emerged, social ecology delineated the scope of the ecological crisis that capitalism must necessarily produce, tracing its roots back to hierarchical domination, and emphasizing that a competitive capitalist economy must unavoidably give rise to unprecedented contradictions with the non-human natural world. None of these perspectives, it should be noted, were in the air in the early 60s, Rachel Carson's silent spring with its emphasis on pesticides notwithstanding. Indeed, as early as 1962, 
Social Ecology projected the alternative of solar energy, wind power, and water power, among other new eco technologies, and alternatives to existing productive facilities that were to become axiomatic to a later generation of ecologists. It also advanced the vision of new eco communities based on direct democracy and non hierarchical forms of human relations. These facts should be emphasized in view of Deep Ecology's attempt to rewrite the history of the ecology movement in terms of its own quasi-religious and scarcity-oriented outlook. Nor should we overlook the fact that social ecology's anti-hierarchical analyses laid the theoretical basis for early feminism, various community movements, the anti-nuclear movement, and in varying degrees, green movements, before they turned from non-party parties into conventional electoral machines. Nonetheless, social ecology makes no claim that it emerged ob novo. It was, and it remains, deeply rooted in Enlightenment ideals and the revolutionary tradition of the past two centuries. Its analyses and goals have never been detached from the understandably less developed theoretical analyses of Karl Marx and classical radical thinkers, like Peter Kropotkin, or from the great revolutions that culminated in the Spanish Revolution of 1936-37. It eschews any attempt to defame the historic traditions of the left in favor of a neoliberal patchwork of ideas or a quasi-political centrism that parades as postmodernism and post-industrialism, not to speak of the post-materialist spiritualism fostered by eco-feminists, lifestyle anarchists, deep ecologists, and so-called social deep ecologists or deep social ecologists. Quite to the contrary, Social ecology functions to countervail attempts to denatur the Enlightenment and revolutionary project by emphasizing the need for theoretical coherence, no less today than it did in the 1960s, when the new left drifted from a healthy libertarian populism into a quagmire of Leninist, Maoist, and Trotskyist tendencies. Social ecology retains its filiations with the Enlightenment and the revolutionary tradition all the more emphatically in opposition to the quasi-mystical and expressly mystical trends that are thoroughly sweeping up the privileged petty bourgeoisie of North America and Europe, with their goulash of anti-rational, spiritualistic, and atavistic ideologies. Social ecology is only too mindful that capitalism today has a nearly infinite capacity to co-opt, indeed commodify, self-styled oppositional trends that remain as the detritus of the new left and the old counterculture. Today, anarchism comes packaged by Hakeem Bey, Bob Black, David Watson, and Jason McQuinn, and is little more than a merchandisable boutique ideology that panders to petty bourgeois tastes for naughtiness and eccentricity. Ecology, too, has been packaged and repackaged into a variety of deep ecologies that generally emphasize an animalistic reductionism, neo-Malthusian hunger politics, anti-humanism, and bio- or ecocentrism, in short, a pastiche, that renders it equally palatable to members of the British royal family at the summit of the social hierarchy and to lumpenized anarchoids at its base. Feminism, initially a universalized challenge to hierarchy as such, has devolved into parochial, often self-serving, and even materially rewarding species of eco-feminism and express the isms that pander to a myth of gender superiority, no less ugly when it concerns women than when it concerns men, in one form or another, not to speak of the outright wealth-oriented feminism promoted by Naomi Wolf, et al. Capitalism, in effect, has not only rendered the human condition more and more irrational, but it has absorbed into its orbit, to one degree or another, the very consciousness that once professed to oppose it. If Fourier insightfully declared that the way a society treats its women can be regarded as a measure of its status as a civilization, so today we can add that the extent to which a society devolves into mysticism and eclecticism can be regarded as measure of its cultural decline. By these standards, no society has more thoroughly denatured its once radical opponents than capitalism in the closing years of the 20th century. The Relevance of Social Ecology This devolution of consciousness is by no means solely the product of our century's new global media, as even radical theorists of popular culture tend to believe. Absolutism and medievalism, no less than capitalism, had its own media, the church, that reached as ubiquitously into every village as television reaches into the modern living room. 
the roots of modern cultural devolution are as deep-seated as the ecological crisis itself. Capitalism, today, is openly flaunted not only as a system of social relationships but as the end of history, indeed, as a natural society that expresses the most intrinsic qualities of human nature, its ostensible drive to compete, win, and grow. This transmutation of means into ends, vicious as the means may be, is not merely the American way, it is the bourgeois way. The commodity has now colonized every aspect of life, rendering what was once a capitalist economy into a capitalist culture. It has produced literally a marketplace of ideas, in which the coin for exchanging inchoate notions and intuitions is validated by the academy, the corrupter par excellence of the best and brightest in modern society and the eviscerator of all that is coherent and clearly delineable. Indeed, never has high culture, once guarded by academic mandarins, been so scandalously debased by academic presses that have become the pornographers of ideology. Bourgeois society qua culture, particularly its academic purveyors, abhors a principled stand, particularly a combative one that is prepared to clearly articulate a body of coherent principles and thrust it into opposition against the capitalist system as a whole. Theoretically and practically, serious opposition takes its point of departure from the need to understand the logic of an ideology, not its euphemistic metaphors and drifting inconsistencies. Capitalism has nothing to fear from an ecological, feminist, anarchist, or socialist hash of hazy ideas, often fatuously justified as pluralistic or relativistic, that leaves its social premises untouched. It is all the better for the prevailing order that reason be denounced as logocentrism, that bourgeois social relations be concealed under the rubric of industrial society, that the social need for an oppositional movement be brushed aside in favor of a personal need for spiritual redemption, that the political be reduced to the personal, that the project of social revolution be erased by hopeless communitarian endeavors to create alternative enterprises. Except where its profits and growth opportunities are concerned, capitalism now delights in avowals of the need to compromise to seek a common ground, the language of its professoriate no less than its political establishment, which invariably turns out to be its own terrain in a mystified form. Hence the popularity of market socialism in self-styled leftist periodicals, or possibly social deep ecology in deep ecology periodicals like The Trumpeter, or more brazenly, accolades to Gramsci by the Nouvelle Droite in France, or to a Green Adolf in Germany. A Robin Eckersley has no difficulty juggling the ideas of the Frankfurt School with deep ecology while comparing in truly biocentric fashion the navigational skills of birds with the workings of the human mind. The wisdom of making friends with everyone that underpins this academic discourse can only lead to a blurring of latent and serious differences, and ultimately to the compromise of all principles and the loss of political direction. The social and cultural decomposition produced by capitalism can be resisted only by taking the most principled stand against the corrosion of nearly all self-professed oppositional ideas. More than at any time in the past, Social ecologists should abandon the illusion that a shared use of the word social renders all of us into socialists, or ecology, into radical ecologists. The measure of social ecology's relevance and theoretical integrity consists of its ability to be rational, ethical, coherent, and true to the ideal of the Enlightenment and the revolutionary tradition, not of any ability to earn plaudits from the Prince of Wales, Al Gore, or Gary Snyder, still less from academics, spiritualists, and mystics. In this darkening age when capitalism, the mystified social order par excellence, threatens to globalize the world with capital, commodities, and a facile spirit of negotiation and compromise it is necessary to keep alive the very idea of uncompromising critique. It is not dogmatic to insist on consistency, to infer and contest the logic of a given body of premises, to demand clarity in a time of cultural twilight. Indeed, quite to the contrary, eclecticism and theoretical chaos, not to speak of practices that are more theatrical than threatening and that consist more of posturing than convincing, will only dim the light of truth and critique. Until social forces emerge that can provide a voice for basic social change rather than spiritual redemption, Social ecology must take upon itself the task of preserving and extending the great traditions from which it has emerged. 
should the darkness of capitalist barbarism thicken to the point where this enterprise is no longer possible history, as the rational development of humanity's potentialities for freedom and consciousness, will indeed reach its definitive end.